Um, so today we'll be talking about beam in production, um, how to kind of get beam working inside a CI/CD um, pipeline. So to give you a little bit about me, in case you haven't noticed from my funny accent, I'm from Sydney, Australia. And um, every time I tell someone that I'm from Sydney, they say the same thing, which is you came all the way here for this. So yes, I came all the way here for this. Um, so we have a small startup in Sydney, which is Monitor. Um, my co-founder and I started Monitor in 2019, and we are proud sponsors, community sponsors of, of Beam. We've been using Beam in production since 2022, uh, sorry, 2020, um, and it actually powers a lot of our real-time streaming. Um, so we're big, heavy users and relying on it. Um, what we'll try to cover today is quite simple. Um, our journey with Beam, so our learnings, what we've taken from it, how we came to use it in production, um, and, and the learnings that we that we learned from that is that how to ensure a reliable pipeline um, <clears throat> and how to deploy Beam across multiple environments. And then I'm gonna do the cardinal sin of presentations and I'm gonna try and do a live demo. So hopefully it doesn't all go up in smoke. Um, so our journey with Beam. So we're gonna teach you something from our experience. So when we first started using Beam in our company, um, it solved a huge problem for us, which was how do we scalably and reliably process a very large amount of data that's coming at us at really high velocity um, and ensure reliability. Um, so Beam really solved that problem for us really, really well. At first, when we first started using Beam, it was very much like a startup, get it up and running. So it was extremely hacky. Um, it didn't really follow great practices in terms of general software engineering. Um, and it involved a lot of manual steps, a lot of you know, local testing, nothing was really automated. Um, but as we matured as a company, and as our clients became bigger and bigger and more kind of enterprising, that didn't really cut the mustard because we needed to push updates to pipelines and ensure that they would work because if they didn't, it had you know, real life, real world effects. So um, you know, we kind of started digging and we found, we stumbled on a couple of things. The first thing that we stumbled on, which, uh, which was Butterfly Flex templates. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And the second thing that was very helpful was the beam testing um, framework, uh, you know, the test pipeline framework. So we have been using Google Cloud Build for as our CI CD for a lot of our backend applications, um, for our web app and you know our streaming application in general. Um, however, Beam's programming paradigm didn't really fit directly into a normal CI CD where you can just kind of lift and shift and it just goes. So there was a fair bit of struggle and pain to kind of get that up and running. So today is really just sharing that pain <laughs> and hopefully that way you don't have to go through the same headache. So just a kind of a caveat, um, everything I'll be talking about today will be in relation to the Python SDK. Uh, everything you can do in Python, you can absolutely do in Java. So uh, very transferable there. So the first thing we wanna talk about is ensuring a reliable pipeline. Um, so as I mentioned before, Beam provides comprehensive testing framework. Um, however, it is not very well documented. Um, the docs for Beam around testing is quite light. Um, they cover the very basic kind of scenarios, and we'll go run through that. Um, but to get a full-on testing pipeline before you push uh, a Beam, Beam pipeline um, is quite challenging. You kind of have to like read between the lines so we'll go through a few, um, a few examples. So this is kind of like a high level, kind of the classes that are available uh, from Beam uh, for testing. Um, there is the test pipeline, which enables you to instantiate a pipeline in the testing kind of form. Um, there are pipeline state matches that allows you to know, say for example, if you have a streaming pipeline, you can say, is this pipeline running? Um, does, the does the state match? Um, there is the PubSub message matcher, which is really interesting as well. It allows you to know, are the messages going to PubSub what I expect? Um, so we're gonna go straight to the code. 
So we're going to run through a few examples. The first is a, just a basic test. And what I have here is all this stuff is on GitHub, both in the Beam SDK, but I've also started a GitHub, and I'll share it with you guys after this, that has this entire code base. Um, so here you just have a bunch of words um, that, <clears throat> and we want to get a count of how many instances those words come up in a corpus. Um, so all we do is just instantiate a test pipeline, just as you would with any other Beam one. Um, you know, but here's the interesting part. So rather than getting it from an IO in, in a test environment, you have to call beam.create. And what beam.create does is it takes an irritable, like, like a list in this instance, and creates a peak collection, right? And then that peak collection can then run through the pipeline. Um, you know, we write the correct combiners and counts per element, and then beam uh, gives you the assert, um, assert class. And that assert allows you to, like you would in any other Python uh, test, say, okay, does this, does the output of this pipeline match what I'm expecting? But it does it in the beam kind of paradigm. Yeah. And we just tell it, okay, this is what we're expecting to get. Does this match what came out of the pipeline? So we can run this test, hopefully. So uh, we just do pytest. Uh, test basic and we don't want to we don't want any warnings and boom passes cool so that means that the, what came through um, was exactly what we we're expecting if we didn't if say that was 11 and we did that it would hopefully fail failed Cool. So just, just as you would expect in any other test, you can now test a very basic transform. We can go to a more complicated thing, which is what's called a composite, composite transform. So when you have multiple, so you have a, a beam step that contains several steps within it. Um, and again, it's pretty much the same. The only difference is that you kind of create a function rather than a class, okay? And you have all your steps there but you decorate it with this beam.pt transform function. So that tells beam that, hey, although this is a function, it's actually a beam transform, and it treats it as such. Um, and again, it's pretty much the same thing. We run the input, we create the input, we call beam.create, they create the p collection, we run it through the function, and we say, this is the output that I'm expecting. Does it match the output? And um, it should do you know, the same thing. There is a couple of more elaborate tests. So here we have the word count. Um, so we are here is what's called a full integration test. So an integration test is essentially an end-to-end -end test. Um, we want to test the entire pipeline. We want to see from end-to-end -end what is going to happen and is the output exactly what I'm expecting. So for a batch, for a batch pipeline, this is pretty straightforward. For a streaming pipeline, it becomes extremely complicated. And we can talk about that in a little bit. So what, what we're going to do here is um, we're going to test the word count batch pipeline full end to end. So we create a class, we create the output that we're expecting. And in a word count, we are, we are getting a file and we're reading, we, we're counting how many words are in that file, right? So in order to get an expectation, we create our own file, we count it, um, and then we, we have that as our expectation. And then we actually call the word count pipeline, which will be sitting in a different module. Yeah? We run the same data through that pipeline, and then we call an assert. We say, okay, does, this, does the result that I got back from the original pipeline match what I'm expecting? So this is a full integration test because you're passing data, letting the pipeline do its thing, getting the data back and saying, does this match what I'm expecting? And if you do it this way, you pass it the input parameters that it's expecting, it works, which is great. Um, so PyTest, test, word count, integration, bang. And we'll do one better. We can even debug this to show you what happens. I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit cocky here, but we'll give it a go.
what's interesting is that once we hit here, so, sorry, didn't put a breakpoint. Um, you'll be able to see that this will actually go to the pipeline, yeah? And pass, now we're actually inside the live pipeline. We're seeing how the data flows through. You can kind of, this is a real, real life test. It's going, the data is going through the pipeline. It comes back to the test and then does the assert. which is really cool. So the data runs through the pipeline, the pipeline ends, and once the pipeline state is done, it comes back to the test, right? Which brings me to my next example, which is the streaming. So the, comp the complicated part with the streaming is that a streaming pipeline doesn't really end. It doesn't have the state done, right? It's just, it's either running or it's off. So. When you try to do a full integration test with streaming, it is a little bit more complicated. There are two ways to test a streaming pipeline. Um, there is a beam create, it gives you this, um, this class called test stream that enables you to essentially mimic a stream. And it is quite comprehensive. So this is it here, test stream, right? You call the test stream like would on a pipeline, and you actually insert elements into that stream. You can set things like the watermark, how much to advance the watermark after each element, um, how much the processing time advances, and then that essentially creates a, a streaming peak collection. And once that peak collection is created, you can push it into a pipeline, okay? And then you get an assert, and that works fine, cool? It is almost an integration test, but not quite, because an integration test is that you're testing live what will actually go into production with an actual um, I.O., including I.O. So in that instance, you need to do a full integration test. And there is an example on GitHub inside the Beam SDK that has a full integration test. And what it does is essentially creates a pop -up topic on the fly, pushes data into the pop -up topic, okay, and then calls the pipeline. Um, with these interesting extra options. So the extra options are wait until finished duration. So it's kind of like a timeout. Um, and what a state verifier that says, okay, I expect the state of this pipeline to be running. And the pub sub message matcher, which says, I expect that the pub sub messages look like this, right? But I, I was unable to get this working, even with the help of several Google engineers. So I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong, which is probably likely, or there is something there that's, that needs some work. Um, I'm still unclear on that, but that is really the only test that I couldn't get working. Um, it is by far the most complicated because you are doing, you're simulating IO, or not you're simulating, you're actually creating an IO, you're pushing data into that IO, you're, you're passing the data to a live pipeline, and then expecting a return, and then asserting that return. So that part was tough. Um, but we will see all these tests execute when we when we do the full CI CD. Anyone have questions or? Cool. So as kind of just high level, so you can you can test do funds as just as a unit test. Um, you can test uh, composite transforms. Um, and obviously you can do integration tests on batch. It's quite straightforward as we saw. On streaming, it is a little bit more uh, involved. Um, so cool, you can test your pipeline. Um, so kind of like right now, we need to actually get this pipeline into production in an automated way. So a really great thing for that is flex templates. So I'm not sure how much you guys know about flex templates, but um, the usual workflow right now is if you're not using templates is that you have some code sitting on your laptop or in a repository and you know you use gcloud commands to kind of push that code up to data flow or whatever runner that you're using yeah so it's convenient as a developer but it is not convenient um, from a business perspective from a workflow and process perspective so 
this doesn't allow, this obviously doesn't allow any automation, particularly around testing. Um, you can only really do local testing, um, debugging and so forth. It's, it's pretty hard to do full integration tests. Um, you have to have access to the code to be able to get these pipelines up and running. Um, and you have to set up your local environment. Every time you want to push a pipeline to data flow, you have to get your local environment up, right? You have to install Beam, you have to install the dependencies, so on and so forth. So it is not the ideal way. Um, so Flex template, uh, templates in general are just a convenient way to kind of package and distribute your pipelines. So a flex template is actually just a user-defined template. So it's code that I've written, beam code that I've written, that I want to package and make into a template. Um, and the templating has really two, two phases. There's the construction phase and the execution phase. Um, and the construction phase is basically just takes your code, uh, implements the pipeline by compiling it, and then um, executing the graph and staging it in GCS. That is done with the help of Docker, with a Docker image. So, and then once it's staged in GCS, um, uh, Google can then take that, that, that file that's staged in GCS and execute the template, and then you get your data flow job running. Um, and the great thing about it is that once it's been compiled and staged, every time you launch it, it doesn't recompile, which is something that, you know, every time you would launch it from your, from your terminal, it would have to recompile the code. Um, and the great thing about it, it can be done from um, the GUI. So as a business process, you can have, um, you can have a non-technical person launch a job, which is really cool because you can, as a developer, you can go ahead and just build a whole bunch of templates, store them in, in Google Cloud, and then when the business is ready, they can go in and with a couple of clicks launch the job. So as I mentioned, flex templates, they allow you to run your pipeline without you know, fiddling around with your development environment. Um, they, they separate the pipeline construction, which is what developers do, from the pipeline execution. Um, so there's no need to compile and so forth. Um, and non-technical users can then run templates uh, using uh, cloud GUI. Um, yeah, so how a flex template works in, in detail is that, so, what it does is it takes your code um, and combine, creates a Docker image, um, stages the image in your container registry, and then creates a spec.json file. That spec.json file is essentially the, the specifications of your template. And it's, it's just a metadata file, but that metadata file is what's actually used to then launch the template. So don't be that guy. We want to deploy Beam across multiple environments in an automated fashion, yeah? So what are the rules? These are the rules of the game, okay? We want to be able to do this without storing any information in Git. There is no environment variables in Git. We, we don't want to rely on any static .env files, right? We want everything to be dynamic. Uh, we want all environment variables to be dictated by the environment, right? So very similar to like how you deploy in Kubernetes, you have a cloud, a config map that, that's you know, associated with the environment, and then that dictates the environment variables. And then sensitive information have to be stored somewhere secure, and that's how we access them. So this is kind of a high level of the architecture that we use. Um, so we can kind of talk through it. Does this thing work? Yeah, cool. Um, so as a developer, I will push code to a repository. There is a trigger in Cloud Build that is associated with that repository. And that it's, it's pretty much just, when I push code to this branch, do X. And that do X is, it can be a number of things, but we use Cloud Build YAML file. And a Cloud Build YAML file just essentially um, tells, gives it the build steps. So step one, do this, step two, do that, so forth. What that will do, step one, is build the Docker image from your code, yeah? Step two is put that Docker image inside a container registry, and, and step three is create the spec.json file and stage it in GCS, and then there is a number of ways you can do this. If in your cloud build, 
you have you have uh, specified to com it automatically launch the template, it will look up the GCS and push it straight to Dataflow. Or you can end your build there, and then the business, when it's ready, can deploy the template. Now, the interesting part is that in this step here, when we're building the Docker image, we want to be able to take variables from the trigger that are environment specific and build a dynamic .env file. And that dynamic .env file will then allow us to access things like Cloud Secret, will allow us to know what bucket we are running in, allow us to know what the image name is, you know, what project are we running in, so forth. And that's how you get fully automated workflow. So this is the code to do those steps that I was speaking about. So here, when you go to cloud build, you create these triggers. You say, what is my project? This is my project ID. What region am I in? Um, where, where is my setup file located? Uh, you know, what bucket will this stuff be able, will you be able to find this stuff? And what is the name of the image that I'm going to build? You load these variables into your cloud build file, and then that, that makes it available to your Docker image. And in your Docker image, you basically just say, these variables that are in Docker, uh, that are in cloud build, get the value and put them in a .env. And that builds a dynamic .env file. And then in your code, you simply just load the .env, and then you have access to all these environment variables that are built dynamically, and that are specified by the environment, not by the user. Make sense? Cool. So um, let's let's see how this works. So this is the cloud build file, right? Step one: build the Docker image. Oh, actually, before that, let's actually go to the trigger. So I can go to cloud build here. Triggers. Team Summit 22. So you give it a name, you link it to your GitHub repository, you say which branch does this trigger associate with. So for us, we do we have like a deploy branch that we know is, you know, it's above master, above everything. This is the deploy branch that if you push this, it will it will try to deploy. Um, you tell it where to look. So look for a cloud, cloud build.yaml file, and you give it the path to the cloud build .yaml, and then you dictate all the environment variables. When you do that, you then come back and create, create the cloud build .yaml file that essentially dictates all the variables and the steps. So step one to get a flex template up and running is that you build the Docker image. And what does the Docker look like? The Docker file kind of looks like this. So GCR has a, um, a data flow template base image. You can also use just the standard Python Beam image. It's the same thing. But because I'm running in Google, it's inside GCR. I'll just make things faster than having to go get it from um, Docker Hub. Um, there are some interesting variables that you have to set. So you have to set these two are mandatory for a flex template to get up and running. And all it is is just. Um, uh, directions to your setup file and directions to your main.py, so where, where your actual uh, pipeline code runs. And this is the part to get the .env dynamically set up. So you call the args, you say, these are the args that I'm interesting in, interested in, um, and you say, okay, get the value of each of these args, name them whatever, and push them into a .env file. And then that dynamically gets it from the trigger through cloud build to Docker to the code. Um, and then it's as simple as once we push, where's my GitHub? So live demo push. Yep. Fingers crossed, let's hope this works. Cool. And then if we come to cloud build, and we go to history, we should see something building. There we go. And then what that will do is that it will build the image, and importantly, it will actually run the tests. So I didn't show you guys, but 
here, right there, that command will then just run all the tests. And what that is doing is saying, PyTest, run all the tests inside the test um, uh, directory. So that will go ahead and build the Docker image, stage the template, and then launch the template. Um, cool. So just some interesting gotchas there. So when when you come when we first started doing this, um, there were some a few interesting errors that we found. Uh, we, it was really difficult to kind of dig down and find out why it's happening. So being a Python developer, if you want to install a library, most likely you will put it in a requirements.txt file, right? But if you do that, when Dataflow comes to launch the template, it actually needs Beam to actually instantiate everything. So because that happens before doing the installation of the libraries, it will fail because it can't find Beam. So it won't work. Um, and you won't get a very verbose error. What you'll get is kind of a timeout error because it'll just keep trying. And then Dataflow has a timeout of 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, it will just time out. Um, and if you, there is a blog, I read a blog by a Google engineer that said how to install libraries on Dataflow and the correct way to do it is to put it into setup.py. And if you do put it in setup.py, again, it will launch, but then when it comes to load Beam, it won't find it. Again, this might be very obvious to the majority of you, but it wasn't very obvious to me. The, the only place that you can put Beam in order to get Flex Template running successfully is in the Docker image. So you have to install it in the Docker image. Otherwise, you're just going to get weird errors. So yeah, just there. So if we go to Cloud Build, this does take some time. Um, but in the meantime, does anyone have any questions? Is, is there an option to have users set variables in the UI rather than um, strictly through the, the Docker file? Um, so if you set the variables in the trigger, which is in the UI, it will get set in the Docker image. But you will need to write code to grab those variables and push them into the code, unless there is a better way that, that I don't know of. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I can probably answer that question. Um, with Flex templates, uh, you have a metadata file. I think you might have described yeah, that. Yeah. Um, when you point to that Flex template in the UI, it'll also grab any variables that were defined for that Flex template. So you could basically if you could hand it off to any user who's using a Flex template, this, this file right here, and you'll Thank see you it in the it. UI show up. So uh, if you, again, this is, I think this is more um, centered around like, continuous deployments, so you're not really interacting with the UI. But if you wanted to create a template pipeline for a user, um, this file right here would actually capture that in the UI. Yeah, so any any like CLI parameters, you would put here inside parameters, inside the parameters array. So you can put, for example, um, I think it's import, you know, and then it's, you know, you can have the topic to your pops up, for example, and it'll go there. Um, but that's, yeah, that's different to like a variable that's being consumed in the code. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, it's, it, I guess it would be a parameter that you use to launch the job, yeah. not one to execute the job. Yeah, so the, the parameters that we're talking about, so if I, say for example, if I wanted to access a database, um, you know, the credentials sit somewhere, but in order to access those credentials, you need some variables. Like, uh, you know, what, what's the project ID? What's the, um, you know, what's the credential name, so forth? Um, yeah, so these are variables that are consumed by the code base rather than by you know, user inputs. So you could have users set like inputs and outputs in the UI, right, after you build the Flex template? Yes, yes. Sweet. They'll, they'll still need to be, you still need to kind of account for them in the spec.json file. 
Um, otherwise, like the template won't know how to consume them. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I had a separate question regarding, I don't know if I missed this, but um, if you consider also using custom containers in conjunction with Flux templates, and if you mentioned that already, I apologize, but I know that for a lot of Python developers, they want to bring in their own libraries, um, and custom containers is something that's supported with the B model that allows you to kind of bring arbitrary packages into your pipeline, and um, it obviates the need to use setup.py or the requirements.txt file. So you you mean just define the libraries in the Docker in here? Correct. So yeah. is it a step that precedes the flex template, but you basically are creating an image. So before you, when you create the flex template, you are um, creating a, using Cloud Build to create a Docker image, a Docker, Docker image. but before that you could actually Start creating, and you're doing that with a a, a base image supported by B. Yeah. Yep. Um, but before that, you could theoretically create a custom container. Yeah, yeah, of course. So instead of here, you can have your own container. You mean precisely? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, of course. So you can have your own container that has Beam and has all your libraries and everything, and you can use that as your base image across the company. And then, you know, that could be your building block on all the next containers that you build. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. I, th I think for Python developers, I just want to call that out because um, whether it be like, you know, num not NumPy and NumPy is pretty basic, but if you have a custom framework, a library that your organization uses, it's a step that would precede Flux templates that could make it even a little better. Yeah, you could do that and it would probably save you a little bit of, because we wouldn't have to compile all those libraries again. And so exactly. Forth. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, that's absolutely a, a way to go, but like, yeah, this is just kind of an example from like from the ground up, sort of if you're just pulling from GCR. Yeah, awesome. I think there's a question here. Hi. Um, is it actually possible to um, add a volume or like a custom file in your image and uh, access the that file via inside your application or inside your pi pipeline. It's a good question because before actually I had a um, maybe I'm just doing it wrong, but I had a scenario wherein I need to access a file, specific file inside the pipeline, and the way I did it initially is tried to include it inside the image, but I wasn't able to do it. But uh, I would like to ask. Um, Maybe I'm just doing it wrong or something. That's a really good question. I personally don't know, um, but I'm not sure if anyone else does. There are instances where uh, uh, people have done this before. Uh, for example, there have been instances where uh, users wanted their uh, SS uh, uh, their certificate and key files in the in the worker for each worker. So you can do that if you create your own custom container like so, so you can put those files in the uh, image and then uh, uh, like create those images in your pipeline if you need them. Yeah, that is possible. Yes, I mean you can also. Uh, there's another parameter Dataflow supports called files to stage. Uh, but that's a tricky parameter to use because uh, files to stage is automatically inferred when you launch a Dataflow job. And uh, if you're using Flex templates, the launching of the Dataflow job is done in the template launcher, which is a VM, which you don't have access to. So uh, the easiest way would be to create your own custom container. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so we can see here from once we pushed, probably can't say that. Once we push the contain, once we push to the um, the branch, went ahead, installed everything, created the template, and then ran all the tests. And we can see here, bang, 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 all the tests were successful. 
And then once it did that, once that is finished, it actually goes to, we'll go to cloud storage, and I'll show you guys what it does. Let's go browse. Data flow template, and we actually dictated this, this path. And you can see that is the spec.json file that it stages. And that's what it uses to actually launch the template. So this, this file is what tells it where to find the image, what the image is called, um, what, the temp what the temporary location of the spec file is. And then once it has access to that file, it can then go ahead and launch, launch the pipeline, launch the job. It does take a fair bit of time. Um, and I'm not sure why what the, what the startup time is, but it does kind of rebuild things from an image perspective. But then in a couple of minutes, this, the DAG will show up and then the job will be live. Any final questions? Sorry, it uh, probably went a little bit quicker than anticipated, but. Yep, question. Thank you.